Welcome back to episode eight of the Irish Home Show. I'm your host, Ben Thompson. I'm an estate agent and author of the Irish Home Buyers Journal. And in this series, I'm taking you through every stage in the house buying process. So far, we've covered everything up to house hunting, and I'm hoping that that has helped you find the future home of your dreams. This week, we'll be discovering what happens when you go sale agreed. Going sale agreed is a major milestone in your house buying journey. It's also the stage where many hopeful home buyers find themselves completely in the dark. You've been so focused on savings, mortgage approval and house hunting that many people are unprepared for what happens next when you finally get an offer accepted. Going sale agreed is a crucial stage where it's important to get everything right to make sure you finally complete your home buying journey. So this week, I'm going to be taking you through everything you need to know on day one when you've gone sale agreed on your future property. Stay tuned for the explainer section coming up next, which will take you through every step. And then I've got a fantastic interview. I'm talking to the brilliant Suzanne Parker from Parker Law about how to choose a solicitor, what they do for you and the kind of fees and costs you can expect from them. So well done for getting this far in your house buying journey. Keep listening and please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and follow us on social media at Irish Home Magazine. Welcome to our Sale Agreed Explainer section. If you're just joining us because you've gone Sale Agreed on a property, then congrats. This section is going to take you through everything you need to know to make sure your house purchase goes smoothly in the next few weeks and months. If you're not there yet, well, carry on this thing because it's important to know what you need to do next when you finally find your future home. There's many things you can do here to get prepared before that stage, and I highly recommend you have certain things in place. So listen in and think ahead for when you finally get that day when your offer is accepted. So far, you've saved your deposit, you've got mortgage approval, and you've been going house hunting to try and find your future home. You've won the bidding war or negotiated a price with your agent and finally got that seal of approval, your offer has been accepted. It often comes with huge relief that you're past the bidding war stage and the house hunting stage, which can be the most stressful. However, the sale agrees stage is crucial and there's a lot of things to do right now. So we're gonna take you through our five main things to do the day you go sale agreed. Now, if your offer has been accepted by an agent like myself, you should get an email or a letter outlining that your offer has been accepted and then the main steps that you need to do next. You're not quite over the line. There'll be a few hurdles for you to get through to really know that this house is gonna be yours. These are my five first steps, of what you need to do. Number one, your estate agent is gonna ask you to pay a booking deposit. If you go back to episode one of the Irish Home Show, we talk through deposits, but we can go through it again now that you know what you're buying. The booking deposit is something that you pay to the estate agent. They will give you bank details for their client account or they'll ask for a check. It is a sum of money for you to put up to show that you are committed to buying this property. Typically, it would be around 5,000 euros, possibly seven to 10,000 euros, or 15 if you're buying a much larger property. In paying the booking deposit, it shows your commitment to buying that house. You're willing to put money down and then you're not just promising empty offers. However, the booking deposit is fully refundable if you decide not to go ahead with the purchase for whatever reason. Maybe the survey comes in with hidden faults, maybe your mortgage approval doesn't come through for this particular house, or perhaps you just change your mind. It is a very weak agreement at this stage. You are not committed and that deposit is refundable from the estate agent if you request it. Just to be clear, this booking deposit isn't the 10% deposit you need to pay on buying the house that is due when you exchange contracts hopefully in a few weeks time although the booking deposit amount can count towards the 10 percent so say you need to put a 10 percent down payment of 40,000 euros you've already paid five to the estate agent that means you'll need to deposit 35,000 with the solicitors to make up the full 10 percent or 40,000 
If you think you're soon to go sail agreed on a house, it's best to have that booking deposit ready to go in an easy access account. Don't leave it in a savings account that's going to take you 10 or 15 days to clear. Make sure you have it somewhere nearby that you can access quickly. It's a very good sign to the estate agent that you're serious and well prepared if you can get that to them in a couple of days. Number two, solicitors. Sale agreed is the first stage that you have to have a solicitor in place. Your solicitor is going to be acting on your behalf to do your side of the conveyancing. That is the legal interaction between two solicitors to exchange the contracts of a sale for a property. Your estate agent is going to ask immediately who your solicitor is, so it's best to have one lined up ready to go. You don't need to have necessarily instructed them yet, but at least have gone out and found quotes for how much they're going to cost uh, compared a few and decided who you're going to go with and have them on standby. As soon as you go sale agreed, I'd get on the phone to them and confirm that you were going to use them and confirm your fees with them and then inform the estate agent of their name and contact details. Once the estate agent has your deposit and your solicitor's details, they're going to write to both solicitors, the vendors and yours to inform each other who is buying the property and who is selling it, how much it's been agreed for, and any other details such as fixtures and fittings and contents. Number three, tell your bank or broker. You need to inform your bank or your broker that you have gone sale agreed. They're gonna to want to know the name of the property and the price you've agreed to pay. So far, you've been sitting on the mortgage approval from that bank. They will kick into action now and go through the process of confirming that they will give you full approval for that particular addressed property. This will include some paperwork on their end and also perhaps rechecking your eligibility and affordability of the property. The bank will also instruct or ask you to choose a valuer who needs to go out to the property. The valuation is a check from the bank that what you're paying for the house is a fair price for the property today. It's usually very straightforward and doesn't involve many issues. Unless you particularly overbid on the house where there was no other bidders or there's something wrong with the house or it needs a lot more work than they think you are prepared to do to make it livable, you usually won't get any rejections at this stage. Despite it being for the bank, you're going to bear the cost of paying for the valuer. It's usually around 150 euros, possibly 200 euros. Be prepared to have that aside ready to go. You can put the valuer in touch with the estate agent so they can access the property and have an inspection. Part four, surveyors. On top of the valuer, you are going to want to instruct a building surveyor or an engineer to go out and have a professional look at the property to make sure it is in good condition and there's no hidden surprises. Even if you are an experienced house hunter or even a professional in the trade, it is important to have a professional survey. It's more than just a expert having a look over the house. There's also a clear written report and a liability involved in that that might cover you if something comes up that wasn't taken account of. Depending on what you're buying, it might depend on who you choose to go and do the survey of the house. If it is a straightforward, reasonably modern house that's in good condition, you might find a typical level one survey is fine. You can arrange this by looking anywhere for a building surveyor, or we recommend our partners get house survey who will find a qualified and vetted building surveyor in your area for a fixed price and within a fixed time frame. Considering how booked up many surveyors are, they are a great service to find someone in a jiffy. If you are buying a doer upper that needs a lot of work, you may need a more serious professional to have a look at the property. It might require a more advanced engineer or perhaps a quantity surveyor as well to work out the costs of the works required. Sometimes this is for your own peace of mind and calculations. Sometimes the bank will request it as well, so they know you have the sufficient funds to make the house habitable within what you're lending them and what you have in savings. Finally, part five of our list of what to do when you go sale agreed is to get your mortgage protection and house insurance sorted. Many people forget about these or leave them to the last minute or just accept whatever terms the bank foists upon them from their partnered insurer. We highly recommend you get prepared early by talking to an expert that might save you money and find you a better deal. We recommend BeatTheBank.ie, our partners here. They are brilliant at comparing everything on the market and finding you the best rate and then undercutting it by surrendering some of their commission. They could be 40% cheaper than what your bank offer you. It is important to get this done sooner rather than later, just in case there's any underlying conditions that you may have that might prevent you getting mortgage protection from a typical mainstream company. 
If so, talk to an expert. There may be alternatives that they can help find you to make sure you can get mortgage protection and home insurance. Both things are a legal requirement if you're buying a house in Ireland and buying a house with a mortgage. If you don't have them in place by the time it comes to drawdown, you will not be getting your money and you will not be able to buy the house. So arrange these things now in advance and so they're sat there ready to go. You don't need to be paying for them yet. Just know that you have been approved and they're ready to go as soon as you get the keys to the house. So that's our main five steps when you go sale agreed. Just to recap, number one, you've paid a deposit of five or 10 grand to the estate agent. Number two, instruct the solicitor and inform the estate agent who you're using. Number three, inform your bank or broker and get them to arrange the valuer to come out to the house. Number four, book a surveyor to come and do a survey of the house to make sure you're buying what you're expecting. We recommend gethousesurvey.ie to find a surveyor in your area. And number five, get your mortgage protection and home insurance ready. We recommend going to beatthebank.ie for the best rate on mortgage protection. These are essentials that you must have in place to, or in order to draw down on your mortgage. So the sooner you can do them and get them prepared, the better. Congrats on going to say a degree in the house. Now on to the next steps. Finally, once you've done those five things on going said agreed, I always recommend it's a good time to stop and just take the opportunity to look at your budget now that you know the price you're going to pay for the house. Now that you know the price you've agreed to pay for the house, you can work out all your finances from here. In the Irish Home Buyers Journal, we have a final budget check page where you can put in the figure that you've agreed to pay for the house, work out what your mortgage is going to be and what deposit in cash you're going to need to put towards the purchase of the house. Say you're buying a house for €350,000 and as a first time buyer, you're using the full 90% of a loan from your bank. That would mean you would be getting a loan of 315,000 euros. Therefore, you have to put 35,000 euros of your own money into the purchasing of the house as a deposit. That's your 10%. You also now know exactly what your stamp duty is gonna be, 1% of the purchase price of the house, in this case, 3,500 euros. You've agreed with your solicitors what their fees are going to be, plus their extras. You've booked a survey, which is going to cost you another 500 euro or so, and a valuation 150 euro. Now is a good time to chart out all those costs and add them up to see what you have left over. So hopefully you saved more than just your deposit and your purchasing costs. If you have another five or 10,000 euros left over, that is something that you can use for refurbishment or furnishings and anything like that for the house. So. Now's a good time to work out your budget and see what you have left over. But be aware of those tricky little extra costs. There'll be a few fees here and there for setting up your mortgage or movers, those sort of things. So leave a bit of a cushion in your budget. Don't go spending it all on fancy furniture now before you close. And finally, it is tempting to go and look for finance for refurbishment work, such as with your credit union, or even taking a credit card out to buy some furniture. Don't do it just yet. The bank are going to look at your credit history one more time before you draw down on your sums. And if you've got any new debt there, they are going to flag it and you may lose your approval. Hold tight. You've come this far. You're not far now to getting the keys to your dream home. Coming up next, my interview with Suzanne Parker of Parker Law. She's going to be talking us through everything that the solicitors do when acting for you to buy a property, how much they can cost, and where to find the solicitor that's going to work well for you. Stay tuned. So this week, I'm joined by Suzanne Parker, Principal at Parker Law in Waterford. Suzanne, how are you? I am very good, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Good. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, as you know, we've been going through the house buying journey and our followers have reached the sale agreed stage. I've been talking through everything you need to do at the point where you have your offer accepted on a house. And of course, part one or part two, the first thing you need to do is be able to tell the estate agent what solicitor you are using. Um, and so I want to come on and speak to you about what buyers should be doing when they're looking for a solicitor. So tell me, where do people first come and look for your services or any solicitor's services when they are looking to buy a house? Every client is different and every person gets involved with a solicitor at a different stage. And um, the best time to get a solicitor on board is always as soon as possible. So even the stage you're at now, sale agreed, that could be a little bit too late. Mm -hmm. uh, because 
you you can always get the call at quarter to five on a Friday. I've gone sale agrees. The auctioneer needs a solicitor immediately. Will you be my solicitor? And of course, yes, we are sure. delighted yeah. to take that client. Yeah, exactly. But that's not what the client wanted. It's not what's best for the person. It's best for them to have engaged with a solicitor, know the quotes, know what includes, knows what's not included. Have a talk to the solicitor. See if you like how they engage with you. Are Things like that. It's always a good idea to kind of talk it out, get a formal quote, sit back and look at it because you want to make sure like buying a house is a very expensive thing and it's the most amount of money you're going to spend. But at the same time, you need to make sure you fully understand, first of all, the costs involved. Second of all, if the person is right for you and that they deal with things the way you like it to be dealt with. So for example, do you like emails? Do you like phone calls? Are they going to be able to respond to you as much as you want? Because I know some solicitors will say, I will give you an update once every week. And other solicitors give you an update every time that something happens on your file. So you could, maybe some people don't want the constant emails and the constant messages, and that could be normal too. So, so a buyer looking for a solicitor, and as you say, you know, to, to arrange that early before they go said agreed is definitely the best way to go. Should they start looking for solicitors in their area, in their local town, or uh, can they widen the net to sort of any solicitor in the country, really? Well, it does depend what they want to do. Now, we act for solicitor for clients all around the country. Um, we do an awful lot over email and Zoom calls and the original documents are then dealt with. But some people want to go into a solicitor's office, meet people face to face a couple of times during the transaction. Completely depends on, on what you do. Work off recommendations to who have your friends used, who have other people in it, you know, recommended referrals because you want to make sure that you you get the service that you're paying for and you want to make sure that you're getting a service that is that is right for you. Um, when you're saying there about cost, cost is very important. So you will always look for, you're not going to pay a, a crazy amount of money when you can get it for something cheaply. But at the same time, you get what you pay for an awful lot of the time. So with a solicitor, you pay with time. And if a solicitor is charging you a certain amount, you are going to be getting, say, 10 hours worth of time with that solicitor. If you pay a lot less, you might only be getting seven hours worth of time, which means they won't have the same time to engage with you. There can be, in my experience, quite a wide range of uh, prices for solicitors, and they're not always um, directly related to how good the service is. Um, I know you can sometimes find a cheap, low-value solicitor who uh, they probably churn out a load of convincing, but you find they're busy doing a lot of other people's work and they're not working for you. Equally, you may find a you know a little country solicitor who probably does one or two conveyances a, a month or they're not regularly doing it. I, it, sound, it sounds like finding someone in the middle who you've had a recommendation from someone else who's bought recently, who's doing conveyancing all the time, but has the time to commit to your, uh, your particular job so they can be there for you exactly. and get you through it in good time. Yeah. That that's what it is because the guy in the in, that might not be doing a lot of conveyancing may only take on one or two cases. You might be the most important person to him, but he may have to charge you four or five times to cover his overheads that week. Um, location. So, say for example, I'm based in Washford. Obviously, my rental is a lot less than when I was based in Fitzwilliam Square. You know, and you can charge an awful lot less when you are um, based in Washford than when you are in Dublin. So, things like that you have to take into account too. That. A Washford firm doesn't have to compete with a Dublin firm with that, that kind of way because they don't have the same expenses. Yeah, and it does seem I've found a lot more people uh, but since COVID are a lot more comfortable with doing Zoom or DocuSign. Um, they're a lot more happy to work with professionals who are remote because you can do a lot of the things online now. Are you finding that you are now finding a lot more clients from all around the country? Oh, it is. Yeah. And I think I even said to you before we came on today that um, I'm in office for meetings two days a week and I'm on Zoom meetings then for two full days a week. So it's completely changed with COVID. But it's great that you can actually you connect with so many more people, you meet more clients and even being able to do something like this. We would have had to before three years ago, if we were doing this podcast, I'd be traveling to you to sit down in front of you exactly, in a studio yeah. somewhere. Yeah, no, it's great. You know, we get to reach out to a lot more people and talk to uh, a lot more people about their expertise. Okay, great. Well, while we're on to that, tell me, what, I've instructed a solicitor, I've gone to say the in a property. What are the next steps? What is my solicitor going to do for me in that process? Well, the very first stage every solicitor is going to do is sign you up officially as a client. And this kind of scares people a little bit because they get documents out from the solicitor. So say in our office, for example, you get an introduction letter and you get four other attachments with it. 
And these are things, this is information the solicitor has to hold about you. They're not being nosy for the sake of getting the information from you. They have to get a letter of engagement from you to engage you as a solicitor. They have to get a document called a Section 150 notice, which is a law society regulated notice. This all sounds boring, but Mm -hmm. anyone listening to this, when the documents come out from the solicitor, it gets a bit daunting that they have all this paperwork to put together. Um, Another document they get is a stamp duty form. This is, allows the solicitor to pay stamp duty for you on closing and gets your PPS numbers over for them to be checked to make sure they're registered. And the final document that we send out is a pre-contract questionnaire. We ask people to fill these in so we can get now. There's a lot of questions on these that you don't know the answers to. And a purchaser would never know the answer to you, like the square footage of the bathroom, things like that. You, you're not meant to. But it's one of these big documents that the Law Society put together that covers absolutely everything. Sure. What we ask clients to do is fill in as much as they can of this. It is to get the information that you know about the property, put it into the format so we know, okay, you're expecting the property to be like this. You're expecting to have three rooms. You're expecting, you know, to pay this much for it. All of those things. And we put that together. That's the first thing that kind of happens with our office. You also have to send in your IDs. Again, your solicitor is bound to keep everything confidential, safely. They'll put that away. So don't, and I'll tell anyone, when you get these papers out from your solicitor, don't worry. If you have questions on them, ask your solicitor. But don't panic because they're not, it's not the end of the world if you fill something wrong in in these papers. You can't, you can't score low on this test. test. You can't get things wrong. No. It's just, <laughs> it's more information and you, it's something, you have. Yeah. It's something we send out these pre-contract questionnaires and there's always a panicking call or an email saying, I, can't, I don't know this answer. So anyone that, when you get these out, don't worry about it. Fill in as best you can. Now, some solicitors might send, not send these out at all or may send a different version of them. This is just how our office operates and how the Law Society recommends you operate. Um, the next stage of things, you've gone sale agreed. So your auctioneer is going to issue a sales advice note out to your solicitor. And this document will have all the information about the purchase on it. will have your name, the vendor's name, the vendor's solicitor's name, your solicitor's name. So just kind of a, the terms of the, of the agreement will go out on paper. Yes. But it gives your solicitor the information to start getting in touch with the solicitor for the vendor asking, where are the contracts? How soon will we get the contracts? When can we close? The important questions. So um, that comes out within a day or two of the booking deposit being paid. Um, contracts can range for coming out immediately within a day or two or months later. But that's kind of it's the, the sales advice is the first step there and signing up officially with your solicitor. Uh, yeah, I think one of the big frustrations for buyers have gone sale agreed and they're eagerly awaiting contracts. Uh, and then they can take weeks or months. Maybe if the vendor isn't well prepared, they haven't called their deeds down from the bank. They haven't got the contracts ready to go before going to say agreed. Uh, what do you as buyer solicitors do? Do you get proactive and start reaching out and trying to chase the other vendors? Or is it really just waiting for them to come with a contract to you? Our office, we will probably wait about seven days before sending the first letter. Because I know when a sales advice note comes in the door and I get a letter from the solicitor on the other side within 10 minutes saying, we have been instructed <laughs> and where are our contracts? You know, just give me, like, I haven't even typed it up yet. So give me a couple of minutes. So I, uh, so I give seven days. Uh, if I don't get contracts within seven days, that's when I start. Other solicitors, they don't, they, they might not follow up at all. They might just wait for the contracts to come in. Um, but what's more important, I think, than starting to follow up the solicitor for contracts at the moment, and this is kind of today's market, is the client to get in touch with the bank immediately. It's the bank we, you, you, you need to keep the pressure on even more than solicitors, I find, at the moment. And it's because the loan offer has to get issued. Mm-hmm. And we can't sign a contract till we have our loan offer. So what I tell clients is as soon as their sale agrees, get in touch with the bank, give them the solicitor's name, give them the address of the property, get the valuation. Those things are the important things because that's what we have control over. And your client yes. has control over. We have no control over the other side. Um, they can do whatever they want, but we have control about the bank. So, um, but yes, we, you always, and like you say to clients, look, if you don't hear from me in a week or in two weeks, come back to me immediately and we'll, we'll, we'll go again, stay in touch with your solicitor. And I love clients when they send me an email saying, oh, just so you know, this has happened. Talk to you soon. You know, and just so I know they're at this stage, the valuation has gone in great things like that, you know, to get an update on. Yeah. That's a really good point, actually, from my point of view. It's a two-way street. I think we're, we're always chasing solicitors to get an update, but it is important that they keep you updated as well. You know, you can, you can get the wheels in motion much, much better if you're communicating with each other. Oh, exactly. 
anything like this, it, it's all about communication and and being open, even with the auctioneer. So you know from the very beginning that the auctioneer knows, is there going to be another property to sell on? How fast can we have this? So for say, for example, contracts are, or you go sale agrees on a house, but the auctioneer knows people can't leave until January or February or March. Tell the buyer so they can mm. make an informed decision about things. Because um, it happens too often that it's only when the contracts come in, we realize there's some delay that people get disappointed if, you, if you're not clear and open about things, which they probably would have been happy about in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. We, we yeah. always try to agree that up front, a part of taking the offer, you maybe not even take the highest offer, you take the offer that's most well suited to the vendor on their timings or in their move, depending on what they're doing. Exactly. And it's exactly the same with the solicitor, except the solicitor that's the most suited to you. Yes. Okay. So you've hopefully received contracts in from the other side, and that'll come with not only the deeds and a bunch of other information. What, uh, what else is it that you guys review in the buying of a property? Yeah, this stage of things are called the pre-contract um, pre inquiries time. So contracts arrive in, in your desk and you review them. You th There's a lot that you do. You you've, First of all, do a planning search against the property. So mm -hmm. you're buying a house that's already built. So it would have been built if built after 64 planning permission. You make sure that you have the documentation for that build, but also that there's been no enforcement notices, no rejections of planning permission, because the people that are buying it might have big ideas about what they want to do with it and want to get extensions and this. If you tell them on the very first day, you're not going to be able to do a thing. They've already been rejected for that mm -hmm. you know, extension to the house. They know this is not the house for them. So it's a very important thing to do is the planning search at the start. You get an awful lot of documentation that are more legal, the legal side of things, but that's what the solicitor is there for. They shouldn't, you, you, stuff that's not interesting really to a client. And I mean that in the nicest way. You check the folio, make sure there's no burdens attached to the folio. If it's something that the client needs to be aware of, you do. If it's something like a mortgage on title, you get it reviewed or re taken off. Um, you do you, the pre contract question or queries. You look at taxes, the LPT, the MPPR. So there's, there's an, a lot of things that you've got to look at to make sure you're in place. Make sure the roads are in charge. Make sure is there a septic tank? Is there a well? Are they within the site? Do you need rights away? Every property is something different. If you're buying a house in the middle of nowhere, say, for example, the house I bought, there are two sheds in the back garden with no planning permission. Sure. I needed to go to the bank and get permission to buy this house. But that's something that's very relevant. I have a septic tank. I need to get, make sure I had a declaration of identity to say it was within the confines. But then something different is, say, for example, my mother is in a housing estate. I needed to make sure that the planning permission was right, that the extension she built out the back, uh, it complies. I don't know if it does. Um, that the widening of the driveway, for example, you need planning permission for that. If they don't get it, you need to make sure there's a retention permit. So every house has something different with it. But that's why, again, communication is so important. Because you need to work with the people, like I'm looking at paper and I see this beautiful paper telling me everything is perfect. But the client is in the house and they can see there's a massive extension out the back that they don't know about. Will we tell the solicitor? You have to tell your solicitor. Um, you, you know, so that's why you send the papers, you say to the client, okay, the house was built on this day. There's been no alterations. How do you feel about this? Is this right? Can your engineer have a quick look at this? Look at the map. Is it, you know, nicer and... Is, there, is it walled in? Is, it, is the map right? Things like that. And the client come back to you and say, no, actually, we're missing a part of the garden. We're doing this. And that's why it's so important that you speak with the clients about this. That's a really good point, actually. It feels like the solicitor really should be part of a team. You have your surveyor, your solicitor, uh, your, your valuer, perhaps, as well. I just had a case yesterday. We have a house in, um, in East Wall where it was originally a two bed and they've squeezed a, a third bedroom into the middle uh, in an area that probably shouldn't be a bedroom. It has a window which is about three meters off the ground. And of course, the surveyor said, well, that, that won't count as a bedroom. Now, we knew this in advance and didn't market it as a, a three bed house. And we just said, look, there's a room there. You can't officially call it a bedroom, but you can use it as such, perhaps. Uh, and that's all tied back in. And that's something the surveyors would feed back into you, perhaps, so you can check to make sure that it has the requirements, has the has the the building regs. Like exactly, that. exactly. And as you, that's the, the the first thing when you kind of talk about something like that, you'd know straight away it's not planning permission because they haven't altered it. But the building regulations would be quite big about something. The same as converting an attic, for example. Yes. If it's not done properly with planning permission, with the proper building regulations, which are quite high about converting an attic, um, mm. it can only be used for storage, and that's it. And when you go to your bank, it's the important thing to let the bank know you're buying a three bed with additional storage and not a four bed. So it is. And even today, I, I, I was talking to somebody and we had to make sure that, 
you know, sending them declarations of identity to say, can you just make sure this is accurate, that everything is within the site? Because the day you buy your house is the day you're going to sell it. And if you mm. buy something today, it's not even about the property itself because you won't know for one second that you don't have a full opinion on compliance with building regulations for this little thing. That doesn't matter to you. But the day you go to sell it, how are you going to sell it to somebody else? You need to go and get an architect involved again, which could cost thousands for them to correct something if you don't correct it now. Um, and as I tell people, when they own the house, any kind of things you do to it, any amendments, get the paperwork in order as you do it. Yeah. So you're not going to be out of pocket by a fortune later. Yeah, um, it's, it's a it's a good point. It's sometimes uh, I know when we bought our house, we were in such a rush to get in uh, to get the keys. Um, my wife is heavily pregnant; it was coming up to Christmas, and we wanted just to get the keys to get in. Um, but you know, you've always got to have that second mind. Look, what if I have to sell this? I may not be planning to sell it for ten or twenty years, but what if I had to for any reason? Uh, do you make sure that the attic was converted correctly, or any extensions were planned for, or have exemptions? Uh, that's something that actually might come up a lot. Um, people will find a house that has had a, an extension built on the back of it. Perhaps it was done in the 80s or 90s. Perhaps it was done within the 40 square meters that you would be allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would needed to be done to make sure that that was all signed off if it hadn't been done already? So say, for example, with that, if it's within the 40 square meters, when you're buying the house from the other side, all you do is ask for a certificate of exemption. That's it. Let them pay the 300 euros to the architect instead of you. And that, yes, that's that's really important. as easy yeah, as it is. It's the yeah. vendor's responsibility to pay for that and it's an architect to come out exactly. and, and sign it off. What if it's something bigger and they do need to go for planning and, and retention? Well, retention permission takes about 12 weeks to go through at the moment. So what we do as I'm selling a couple of houses now that there was alterations to it. Um, if the person is getting a mortgage, they have to make sure planning is right. So we we're, we're, the client is actually going and getting retention permission. We're signing contracts now. But the closing date is one week after the retention permission comes through. In other cases, if the purchaser was not getting a mortgage, which um, would be great, but they can make a decision that not to perfect title like that or do it themselves. And you get you get money off the house, really. Um, but most people, but you de then have the difficulty again of if you try, ever try to sell it. Yeah, so sure. like I know I was the exact same as you. I wanted, it was coming up to Christmas week. I think I closed on the around the 17th of December. Yeah. I didn't care. I didn't care about this. I'd just do anything. But my solicitor wouldn't let me. And that's the point of why a solicitor is there. And that's their job to look out for you, protect you from yourself as well as from anyone else. Yes. Exactly. Because I was like a spoiled child when I went sale agree. Just give me my keys now. Uh, but I can't do it because I, I might want to sell this. Um, and then I never went for retention permission. But if I do or try use the the sheds out the back for anything other than kind of storage, I've got to yeah. get a change of use and planning permission on them. Okay, so it's showing there's a lot of things the solicitor do. They're an essential part of the, the buyer's process. Um, just to go back on fees for a second, when I do go to a solicitor, a first-time buyer goes to a solicitor and gets a quote on fees. There's typically your fee, uh, and then there's some extras on top. Just explain what those can be because then it can get confusing and what the total cost of the legal fees are going to be. The, the legal fees, everything except the professional fee should be the exact same with every solicitor or within, within 10 or 20 euro. So you've got your professional fee. Always remember there's VAT on top of that. So if a solicitor says to you, great, my fee is this, and you think fantastic, remember 23% on top of it. We don't really consider VAT as as anything extra we're charging because we never get to hold on to it. We have to pay it to the tax man anyway. But when they give you a full formal quote, the VAT will be included on it. The other things on that taken into consideration are stamp duty. So it's 1% of the value of the property for a house and up to an acre. If, for example, you're buying a house with another acre attached to the back of it, you wanted a really big garden, the second acre is 7.5%. So it might have a very low value. So the house and the acre might be 400,000. And then the other acre could be worth 10,000. It's still an extra 750 euros to keep in mind. Mm. Um, that It's just, you know, instead of being the, the 40 euro, it's a little bit more. So 1% of the, the, so that's a big, like on a 400,000 house, that's 4,000 euro you're paying in stamp duty. So that's the biggest cost of the outlay. Other things that you need to look at are your planning search. So the planning search, depending on where you're located, the fees change. So most places in the country cost €184.50 to do a planning search. It's €150 plus VAT. An architect can do one for you, but he might charge more to actually go and visit the planning office. Um, 
the other thing then you need, oh, Dublin is only 67 euro, 65 cent. Some, and this is with the law searches we use, other law searches charge different amounts. They might charge 80 euro or 90 euro, but these are a general amount. And if you're getting a planning search in Cork, it costs 253 euro, 75 cent. Okay. Sligo as well. Um, other search costs or other costs then would be your closing costs. So on the day of closing, you do a closing search against the people on the other side, make sure no one's bankrupt, the house is still good. There's no additional judgment, mortgages or anything been registered. That costs about 50 euro plus VAT. So 60, 65, 19 is the exact figure for that. Next thing then you need to do is some swearing costs. So you sign a declaration for the bank saying whether you're a family home, whether it's not a family home, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're divorced. That could be about 10 euro per signature. So if it's a couple buying, about 24 euro for that. Um, then the registration costs are the next thing always based on the value of the property. So a house that's 200,000 with a mortgage, the registration costs on that would probably be about 800 euro. Anything over 400 euro or 400,000 would be 1,015 euro. So that's 800 euro for the transfer, 175 for the mortgage and 40 euro for the folio. They're all legal costs, okay. right? Okay. Other things, and I'm just going to tell you, because it's something that a lot of solicitors don't say at the start, but it's something you need to know about. The local property tax Mm -hmm. and management company service charges. Yeah. Even though they're not considered legal expenses, you still have to pay them on closing. So if you're buying a house and say you're closing the house now on the 1st of November, you need to repay to the solicitors on the other side the last two months of the local property tax for 2021 and all of 2022. Wrong way around. 2022 and all of 2023. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The government consider whoever owns the house on the 1st of November, the legal owner of the property for the entire following year. So you just pay it back. So if say it's 100 euro, well, let's go easy with this, 120 euro for the year, 10 euro a month, you would end up paying 140 euro. It's not a legal cost. Nothing that the solicitor has control over, but it's more money that you have to pay out on closing. Sure. The other thing then, service charges. If you're buying in a managed housing estate or in a, an apartment complex, mm -hmm. there's management costs there as well. That's apportioned from whatever day it's owned. So you could have to pay. So it could mean you're expecting to pay to the solicitor 6,000 for closing and you have it ready to go in your bank account. And then you get the closing cost statements and they're really looking for 7,000. That's a big yeah. jump. Mm. So it's best to know at the beginning. And the thing is, they will know as soon as the contracts come in, they can let you know what that figure is. So you're not getting a surprise. So they're not technically hidden charges, but a solicitor will, sh should let you know as soon as they know. So there is no surprise. You have a hundred other things you want to spend a thousand euro on probably coming to closing. Yeah, no, it's but it's really important, and we try and uh, try and educate guys that they should have this money put aside. There's always extra surprises and costs, exactly as you say. Mm -hmm. So to make sure they have a, that they're ready to go, and they haven't gone and spent it on furniture or new flooring or something yeah. like that for the house. You know, get it over the line. Make sure you have the money there. Now that's a good time to raise. Um, when will the buyers be transferring money to you? How much do they need to put with you guys uh, to include the deposit and your fees? When well. Every solicitor is different about when they want the fees. Some people might look for a retainer at the start. So I can only talk about our office. and That's kind of what I'll explain now. So when you're signing the contract, that's when you pay 10% of the, the payment. So if you're getting a mortgage, say you're getting a mortgage for 90%, the rest will come for closing. Some people get mortgages for maybe 85% and pay a little bit more themselves. That doesn't matter for the contract section. On contracts, to make it legally binding, you pay 10%, no more, no less. Some new bills don't look for as much as 10%, but we're talking just generally about kind of maybe secondhand houses. So if you pay a booking deposit of, say, €5,000, you're buying a house again for 400000 When you're signing the contracts, you need to pay that balance of thirty five over. Mm -hmm. That makes the contract legally binding. Now, the closing costs, which would be the money for the legal fees, the registration, all of those kind of things, the stamp duty, we ask a client to send it to us about seven days before closing. Okay. But then that does depend as well on what the bank wants. Some of the banks at the moment look for a letter from a solicitor confirming they hold all funds for closing. If that is the case, we look for that fund, those funds to be with us 14 days before because some of the banks, uh, and uh, without even kind of naming which ones, some of the banks are taking 14 days at the moment to release funds from the last document being lodged. So that's why we'd look for it that 14 days before. So we're not holding things up at the end because of the letter. 
Okay, so the buyers have lodged their money with you. You're ready to uh, send their 10% over to the vendor solicitor and they are presumably going to come in and, and sign contracts ready to go. What happens in the last few days between signing and finally closing the house and getting the keys? Yeah. So it's only when the purchaser, so your client, has signed the contracts and sent back to the other side. That's only when the closing date is a fully kind of arranged. So the contract might say a closing date is 14 days from the date of the vendor's signing. But the vendors are the second people to sign. So when you sign your contracts, you still are not completely sure about what the closing date is going to be. Mm. Um, the contract as well is not binding until the other side have signed it too. So everything is a little bit up in the air for that little bit of time. Yeah, uh, It could be a couple of days. It could be a couple of weeks waiting for the other side to go in and sign. What we tell our clients that we do is we send the documentation back to the bank and look for funds as soon as possible. We tell people to hold fire on starting their policies, which would be the life cover and the house insurance, and only start those when we know the other side have signed. This means the legal paperwork is being processed by the bank. It won't be delayed, but the, the bank will start working on those, but they're not going to be at risk of funds being drawn down or us getting money for the bank without an actual house to buy. Because there's always a risk there until the, the contract's signed by the other side. And you, the last thing we want to do is put a client at risk. Mm -hmm. But the first thing we want to do as well is make sure they're not delayed and we can get them in as soon as possible. So it's a, it's a juggling act. And again, communication. Pick up the phone, ring the solicitor on the other side saying, well, how soon can you get your clients in? Will you, will you email me over a copy of that contract as soon as you can? All of these little things. And right now we're under a lot of delays at the moment with banks taking a little bit of extra time. But at the same time, we are under an awful lot of pressure to get stuff in before interest rates go up and change. So again, it's a juggling act. We don't want to get money from a bank too quickly because we don't want to put our clients at risk, but we can't leave it too long because we have to get money from the bank before the interest rates go up. Um, so, so that's kind of what happens during that stage. But say we know the other side have signed with money on the way from the bank. We know it's coming. What we do in our office is... Um, one of the girls that work with me, she she telephones the banks for me three days a week, um, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, and keeps pushing the bank seat. Because <laughs> it, it could be little things that are delaying something. Maybe they're waiting for something from a client. Maybe they just realized some AML is out of date, something like that. That if we keep ringing and keep checking on things, we're not going to get stuck on the day of closing. No money has arrived. And then we've got a disappointed client. So something like that. And even the client themselves, we tell them, look, check in with the auctioneer, make sure everything is okay give us a call, check with the bank to your broker to see what we can do. Um, and things like that, it's only could be on the last day. And it's happened to me a couple of times, a couple of days before closing, the bank have realized, oh, we want something else done with this or you know, another document they need to. And it happens that it just it waits until it gets to that person. Yeah. It's always something small, like a, 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 a historic tax or something like that, or an LPT or something like that, that they just need to form again yeah. or needs a copy of something. And uh, it delays you in yeah. a couple of days. Yeah, I always say take, take that closing date if it's setting the document as with a pinch of salt, because there's always always something delaying it. And it always seems to be four o'clock on a Friday afternoon that everything finally closes and there's a rush around yeah. to get the keys and get in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that's exciting too. That's the that's the interesting part. You need a story about closing and collecting the keys, going it through is. a snowstorm to collect them. You know. Yeah, yeah. And with um, a baby in arms. That's generally generally what yeah, I hear. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or on the way to the hospital or something like that. It's always that sort of way. So yeah. yeah. Great. So so, but, people um, finally, so hopefully people will finally close close their sale. Um, what happens next? You know, they've got their keys. They probably. Uh, the thoughts of their solicitor have gone out the window. Um, but what do you recommend to first-time buyers uh, when they've finally got their first home? Um, what do they need to do just to finalize with you guys? Well, it, it, with us, they, they get the message to tell them to go collect the keys. That's the stage that we go ahead and do the stamp duty, the registration, and the, the send the title deeds to the back to the bank. That can take a little bit of time. And depending on where the house is, what they need, some people need evidence that they're the owners of the house, say if they need to get parking permits, if it's on a public road, something like that. We won't have them register a property. The land registry you're taking, I, for new bills, they could take up to a couple of years to put them through. If there's a first mm -hmm. registration, again, it could be a couple of years. If it's a, a new build, or sorry, if it's a registered house, mm -hmm. I could get that back in, in a weekend. You know, so everything depends on the type of property, the type of registration that's needed. If you're buying parts of some kind of section, it takes a bit longer. So if they need something like that, get in touch with your solicitor. They can give you a letter. They can give you a copy of the deed of transfer. 
things like that. They got a copy of the full accounts. And that's one thing that you have to do by law. It's called a section 152. So it's the other side of the section 150 at the start. It's the closing one. And what you'll see on that is a full list of all of the expenses, all of the outlays. It'll show the government charges. And then it'll also show on our, on our 152s, it shows how much time that this case took for us. <laughs> so say we made a quote to you based on 10 hours. It never only takes 10 hours. It's usually around the 15 or 16 mark. We'll show them this case took 16 hours and we're writing off the balance because it's what legally we want to tell the clients. This is what you, you received from us as a service. And then the last thing is a statement of account, which shows every penny that went in and out on their behalf and what's going back to them. So that's it. They're fully entitled to it and they should always receive it and have a look at it to see what to make sure the figures are right, because it often happens that a solicitor, maybe they've got 20 closings on the same day. Do they overcharge you for something? Is there something, is there money left on account? Why is there money left on account? Always in our case, my accountant will kill me if I do anything wrong. <laughs> but um, there's always 40 euro left on account for closing. And that's because we need to get a new folio or file plan from the bank. That's So it's expect, and in our letter, it'll explain why there's that little bit left there. Um, but on the legal side of things, your solicitor will then send the title deeds back to the bank when you're registered. We'll send you a copy of the folio showing you're the owner and they'll close their file. Um, and the next time you might need the solicitor again is if you're doing a remortgage or you're selling it. So that's kind of the end of the, the solicitor's job is when the registration is completed, the stamping is completed. They've given you a full copy of the accounts and they can then, we do have to retain files for 12 years. So not the title deeds. So if you need something that we might hold on the file, you can get a copy of it. Right. But most things will be gone back to the bank. But it is 12 years that we have to hold it in storage before it can get destroyed. If you're looking for something that's 13 years old, any solicitor, will, it could be destroyed by then. One thing we would always recommend to clients to do. So the night before closing or as soon as possible, as close to closing, have a final walk through the property. Yes. Make sure it's cleared. Make sure you're happy with the condition. Make sure there's nothing, there's no Christmas trees still in the attic. <laughs> things like that, because on the day of closing, it's now your house. So if there is, if the bins are full, you're accepting that. And that's part of the property you're buying. I know it shouldn't be, but on the day of closing that you're taking responsibility for its current condition. So just try and arrange it. So when you know the money's been issued by the bank, you'll get a call from the bank or your app will change to say funds are being released. Give a call to the auctioneer and go out and see if you can just do a final, a final look around to make sure everything's okay. Yeah, it's a really good point because, as you say, there could be stuff in the attic or just rubbish everywhere. That's going to cost you money to clear, and that's not really your responsibility. Uh, the other thing as well is, uh, have they left what they said they're going to leave? So white goods and appliances, have they not ripped them out at the last minute without you knowing? Um, I had a client who took all the big slide robe doors out, even though they were way too big for her future house. They just She decided to take them with her, and they all had to come back in a van the day of closing to, to ensure that closing happened. So all those sort of things like that, inventory, and fixtures and fittings to make sure what was promised to be staying with the house is staying and they haven't, they haven't wrecked the place because it's probably been a few weeks or months since you last saw it. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for all of that. That's fantastic. I think that's given everyone a really clear overview of, uh, of what they need to know when they're trying to find a solicitor. Where can people find you if they want to see if you can be the solicitor for them? Oh, I'd be absolutely delighted to be contacted by anyone. Uh, Parker Law Solicitors in Henrietta Street in Washford is where we're based. My email address is sparker at parkerlaw.ie. And you can also give a call to us in the office. It's 051 878 Zero. Look us up as well. Find us on Google. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Solicitors. I would say you are. You're good on Instagram, but also they'll also find you as the solicitor in the First Time Buyers Ireland Facebook group, which I highly recommend. Your comments in there are so useful, and you're always there to lend advice. So um, it's it's brilliant to have you there, and uh, you can help people if they have any questions. All right, Suzanne. Thanks for talking to me today. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. You've saved your deposit, got your mortgage approval, and you're bidding on your dream home, hoping to go sale agreed soon. But have you sorted out your mortgage protection? It could be something that puts a spanner in your home buying journey at the very last minute. It's a legal requirement to have mortgage protection in place before you can draw down your loan. If you can't qualify, you might not get your final approval and you'll lose out on your dream property. It pays to speak to the experts early to make sure you're covered. Our partners at Beat the Bank are the simplest way to get protected in just a few clicks. Go to beatthebank.ie, fill out their simple forms, 
and you can have a quote within minutes. Don't just go with the standard mortgage protection offered by your lender. Beat the Bank could be 40% cheaper. You can sign up in minutes completely online and find policies from just €10 Euro a month. Beat the Bank price match all the top insurers, then get you a discount off the best rate. So whether you're soon to buy your first home or you already have mortgage protection in place already, go to Beat the Bank today to see what you could save. Now, for this week's In, Out and Away, I thought we'd do something a little different. I'm still going to be looking at properties in the city centre, on the outskirts and then out of town. But this week, I'm going to focus on apartments. Often when I do in, out, and away, the in will be an apartment because that is what's affordable at that price range in the city center. And then as you go further out, we would look at houses that you could afford for the same price. However, some people just want an apartment for whatever reason. So why don't we look at apartments around Dublin City and on the outskirts and see what we can afford. I'm starting with a price range of around 375,000 euros. That seems to be quite a standard price for a lot of apartments around Dublin City. We're going to start with our in property this week is 64 Hanover Dock. This is right down in the Grand Canal Docks. It is on the market at 370,000 euros. It's one bed and only 50 square meters. Now it's been tastefully decorated inside, but what you're buying here is really the location. You're right on the doorstep of the Grand Canal, the Borgos Theatre is across the way, and you're right in the heart of all of Ireland's major tech and financial firms. Meta is just down the road, Google is across the canal, and there are hundreds of other firms on your doorstep, not to mention the amenities and the nightlife that Dublin has to offer. If you're a work hard, play hard type of person, and you just want your apartment to be a bolt hole for you to sleep, this could be a great location for you. Alternatively, our out property on the Dublin suburbs is this two bed apartment in Stepaside. This is Bellamine and 55 The Willow. This is an apartment I'm selling. It's on the market for 370,000 as well. But for that in this location, you get two proper double bedrooms, two bathrooms, and it extends to 85 square meters, which is a good size for an apartment. It has two balconies, both east and west facing, and quite a spacious living room with a side kitchen. Of course, you're a bit further out than Dublin city centre, but this location is quite handy for the Lewis, and I find a lot of buyers are buying here, happy to commute into town, or perhaps they work for some other companies that are on the peripheral. Microsoft is just down the road, and much of Sandy for Business Park is nearby as well. And finally, for our away apartment this week, we're getting out of Dublin and just crossing the border into County Wicklow, into Bray. This is for Wilford Court. And this, for 379000 is a three-bed duplex. So it is over two floors. You have a living room and kitchen and one bedroom on the first floor and then two bedrooms, two bathrooms on the upper floor. This extends to 114 square meters, so you're really getting a lot of extra space for around the same money. It's a bit further out, but you're one street back from the seafront and the dart station there at Bray, which would take you into town. It's facing the wrong way for sea views, but you have lovely mountain views of the Wicklow Mountains in the distance. All these apartments are relatively energy efficient with either B3 or C1 ratings. And for the price of 370,000 euros, you can choose between a one bed in the city center, a two bed on the outskirts in Stepaside, or a three bed in Bray? Tell me in the comments on our social media which one you would choose. Now for new home versus old home, I thought I'd stick with apartments and just see what new build apartments are available out there. They are few and far between. Most new build apartment blocks in the city center have all been built to rent. That means they're not available to buy to you and I. They're only bought by large institutional investors. So to find a viable apartment in Dublin is quite difficult. However, I've been watching this block in Fox Rock being built for the last two or three years. This is Springfield Park. It is on the edge of the N11 next to Loretto College School. Fox Rock and Black Rock are areas with largely houses, not that many apartments. So a new build apartment block is quite a rarity in the area. These modern A2 rated apartments start from 615,000 euros. That buys you an 88 square meter two bed. That's a fairly hefty price for an apartment in South County Dublin where you could buy a house for a similar amount. Who would be buying this sort of thing? You might get a young professional who is happy with an apartment and it's a convenient commute along the N11 or to one of the local business parks in South Dublin. Or perhaps I often find downsizers like these homes. They've sold a large family home in the area and they want something energy efficient and secure to live in in their later years. But let's go see what old home we could find in the area that could be an alternative. 
Just down the road in Cabinteti, this is 97A Beech Grove Cottages. This is a beautifully stone-fronted, single-story cottage, uh, which has been extended to be a three-bed for 114 square meters. It's on the market with us for 650,000 euros and is rated a D1. Not quite as energy efficient as the new built apartment, but it has gorgeous interiors and a nice little garden. You're getting more inside and outside space, plus off-street parking. Being all on the level, this would be great for a downsizer or for any young family starting out. So, which would you choose? The new build apartment for 615,000 euros or the period cottage for 650,000? Tell us in our comments on our social media channels. We're nearly at the end of the show now, just to touch upon this week's property news, and it's mainly about interest rates again and mortgage lending. Last week, we just heard that the central bank was going to relax their mortgage lending restrictions. Mortgage buyers can now get up to four times the value of their annual income. However, that is only a maximum limit set by the central bank. What you can actually borrow will still depend on your eligibility and what you can afford, which is calculated by your lender. So make sure you speak to a broker or your bank to see what you could borrow. We also found out that second time buyers will be allowed to borrow up to 90% of the value of a home. Previously, it was 80%, so they needed a much larger deposit to put down to buy the next home. Both these measures will hopefully make it a little easier for buyers to afford some of the higher house prices out there. And it makes moving for second time buyers slightly easier as well. This news has met mixed responses in the market. A lot of buyers are grateful that it will help them buy something that they couldn't have otherwise afforded before. But there's caution from professionals. Just worry that borrowers could overstretch and take on too much debt at the wrong time. There are also fears that this might help inflate prices. I think they're probably counterbalanced by the increase in interest rates that we're seeing across the board now. But at least this will do something to alleviate that for some people. In other interest rate news, Finance Island are retracting their longest term fixed rate mortgage. They had been offering a 20 year term for the last year. That has now been taken away and the maximum term you'll get with them is 10 years. Now, there are other banks who are offering longer term fixed rates and they're worth looking at if you'd like the certainty that you're gonna be on the same interest payments for the next 10 or 20 years. There's still some good offers out there. So if you're about to sign on the dotted line for your home and fix your mortgage, or if you already own your home and you're thinking about switching, it may be a good time. It looks like long-term interest rates are gonna go up again in the next year. So now might be a good time to lock in. That's all our property news this week. Thanks for tuning in to episode eight. We're just over halfway in our series of the first time buyer's journey. Next week, we'll be covering more on from sale agreed to getting your keys. Please stay tuned and come back and listen next week. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast and follow us on social media at Irish Home Magazine. I'll talk to you soon.